Now let's go on and look at the United States now. So the, the headline is 140 million Americans have had uh, coronavirus. Zero prevalence from commercial laboratories. Now this is looking at infection induced antibodies. So of course we can look at different antibodies the production of which is of course stimulated by the various proteins so spike protein uh, antibodies could be the vaccine or the um, or the virus but the one this survey is looking at is the nucleocapsid protein which means that the person has been exposed to the uh, inside part of the virus so it's only occurring as a result of natural uh, infection now, 58% uh, of up to 17-year-olds have, have, uh, have had ant antibodies, indicating that indicating they've actually had the infection. They've been exposed to the virus itself. Uh, now, this data is from 72,000 blood samples taken in January, so it's clearly a bit out of date already. And it's a percentage in the United States resolving or past infection with sars coronavirus 2 Or so, so they are saying, but in fact, because it's looking at antibodies people that had the natural infection early on in the pandemic may well no longer have detectable levels of antibody. So this is an absolute minimum number. So the actual 140 million is a completely minimum number. And that's one of the reasons why it's a minimum number. Um, so not how much antibody is present. And then this is a direct quote, do not necessarily indicate the percentage of people with sufficient antibody protection against reinfection. I mean, really, are they, are they really saying here that the factor in reinfection is antibody levels? Um, I, I would have thought the longevity of protection is determined by the B and T cells. So now given this is coming from the CDC, a bit, a bit disappointing that they, uh, they seem to be implying that. Because we know that vaccination will dramatically increase antibodies in the short term. But what we're interested in is long term immunity with the um the b and the t memory cells so quite why they put that in like that um, is a bit difficult to determine these percentages do not include people who have been vaccinated against sars coronavirus to and have no history of infection so that's natural infection uh, 140 million from there now i went that they, they have a paper a link to a paper here so i clicked on that link and i thought oh that's good they've got a paper i'll go direct to that and get the results but that took us to a paper that was dated to september 2020 so really, really, I mean, the, the, the CDC here are referring to as a, to as a, a paper from 2020, uh, and they're strongly implying that immunity is determined by antibody levels. Not impressed, to be quite honest. Given the amount of money you poor taxpayers in the United States are paying these guys, not really impressed so far at all. Anyway, so I went directly to the, to the site, which was up to date. Well, when was it up to date? It's rather hard to tell. Um, it's certainly no later than January. And of course, this is we're six weeks, uh, minimum of six weeks later into Omicron now. So the number of infections there could easily have doubled, easily. So it could be, it could be 280 million people have been exposed to the virus quite easily. Uh, that, that is quite, in my view, that's quite feasible. But the zero prevalence estimates in January, 43.3% uh, of the American population. Uh, number of estimated infections, 140 million. Number of cases, in other words, the time the, the times this has been detected. And again, that, that's just till the end of January, um, 74 million. So it's kind, it's kind of a times two, isn't it? Um, but as we've said, this number is is a minimum for the number of people that have been real actually infected because they're only looking for antibodies and antibody cover will wane. And as we said, that's looking at the nucleocapsid um, antibody. Um, zero prevalence by demographics, quite interesting in the States here. Um, so this one is zero prevalence by demographics, so age. So here we see uh, 0, 20, 40, 60, 80 percent in numbers. These are the sample sizes. So they've taken 20,000 there, 16,000 there, 22,000 there, 14,000 in that age group. So if we take 0 to 17 year olds, they've taken 14,000 samples and uh, they've found that the prevalence there is, uh, is around about 60 percent. So it's higher. The prevalence is higher in younger people of natural infection. 
Older people have had lower levels of natural exposure, at least as of January. Male, female, as you'd expect, you wouldn't really expect a difference there, would you? Estimated zero prevalence estimates percentages here. So again, we do see this going up quite dramatically to about the 43% we are now. But if that's kind of, uh, that's October, November, December, so this is kind of January. So this is only, according to this graphic, kind of mid-January. So as I say, could easily be way much, uh, so much higher now. Could could be double that now. So this is giving, a, um, if you like, a, an out-of-date, somewhat pessimistic view of the level of natural immunity that will have been developed as a result of exposure in the States. So they do seem to be, um, yeah, they're, they're, giving, they're giving the minimum levels of protection, I think, here. Now, there's another study in the States from blood donations, and this one is looking at uh, uh, infection by vac um, national COVID-19 infection and vaccination. So this is infection and vaccination. So in other words, they're looking for any antibodies, whether it's caused by the spike protein or the nuclear caps capsid program or the others. Uh, the percentage of 16 year olds developing antibodies against SARS coronavirus 2 from vaccination or infection. So this is both. And as of December 2021, so again, hopelessly out of date. What are these? Well, why don't they keep this vaguely up to date? Dear me. Anyway, 94.7. Now, in the, in the UK, we know this figure is 95.5%. So in the UK, basically everyone's been exposed to the virus now. Virtually everyone. In the States, a little bit lower. Persons aged greater than 16 years of age with more than one COVID-19 vaccine dose, 70%. Again, that will be slightly higher now. Cumulative reported COVID-19 cases per 100, 14.7. Specimens tested 136,000. So um, pretty disappointing, really, the, um, the, the quality of data we're getting from the States. Now let's move on to Australia, which is really pretty interesting. So here we have the... Uh, this is the shape of the uh, the Omicron wave. So that's taking us from January. This is the Omicron wave in Australia. Scooted up and going down now. Now it's going to probably carry on at about this level for a period of time now because Western Australia uh, has just opened its borders. So uh, basically everyone in Western Australia will be getting exposed to the virus if they haven't been already in the next few weeks. It's going to take a little longer to get to the rural areas, but places like metropolitan Perth, it's going to spread around it really pretty quickly. So that's the shape, what we would expect really in Australia, that kind of shape. Um, now this is, um, th this graphic here shows the, th this is the active cases and this is the, uh, the well basically they're all locally, they're, they're all locally and quiet, um, they're basically all now locally acquired. So active cases and, and new cases. Um, so we see, I'll show, show you what on this one actually, I've got it on, um, got it on here. Um, what we see on this is Australia overall, uh, capital territories, um, that's, that's in, in, in the east. Uh, New South Wales, well that's obviously not correct, there's a data drop out there. Northern Territories, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria. So still going on in the east. But what's happening now, Western Australia has just opened up. So these numbers in Western Australia will be going up. They will be going up. Well, they'll be going up now. As we speak, they'll be going up now. Current COVID-19 cases in hospital and intensive care in Australia. So this is the country overall. And... Here we see the effect of Omicron on the highly vaccinated population, and um, it's not it's not great, but it's nothing like some of the previous waves. Absolutely nothing like it. So that's this is Australia overall. Hospitalised, uh, we've got 1,684 not in ITU, 105 in ITU, 1,753 for the whole country. So as I say, because of the phase of the pandemic i'm expecting the new south wales figures to stay flat then start going down soon uh, same for the queensland figures same for the victoria figures but the western australia figures will be going up because they've just opened up they are a bit behind um, hopefully not very much at all because as we said it's a highly vaccinated population but they will be going up somewhat unfortunately 
but um, I'm optimistic not beyond the ability to, to cope with it. I, I'm not expecting a Hong Kong situation because the older demographic in Western Australia is fairly highly vaccinated. Now finally today we'll look at the Office for National Statistics data. Just before I look at some graphics, let's look at this. Um, now the prevalence, I was just talking to Tim Spector about this yesterday, and the prevalence is still high. There's still a lot of COVID around, but thankfully not going into hospitalizations and deaths or, or reducing numbers. So in England, during during the week, of course, this is always this is always the week behind. Weekend in the 19th of February. Well, it's a couple of weeks behind, isn't it? But but there you go, that's what we've got. Um, one in twenty-five people in England had it, one in thirty in Wales, one in fourteen in Northern Ireland, one in twenty actually had the infection that week. So we still here to see that the prevalence is really high. And you could argue that this is good news because this is inducing a lot of um, natural immunity. So England percentage testing positive is starting to go down somewhat now, round about the just under 4% mark as we've noticed. Scotland still going up. Curious, Scotland still going up. I'm expecting that to level off pretty soon, but potentially remain at this reasonably high level for a period of time. Tim Spector yesterday thought that we might be stuck with these kind of levels for, for a period of time. Didn't quite say how long, but potentially till the better weather arrives. But if people aren't getting sick you know, and it's producing more immunity, then how big a problem is that? Now, this is BA2 and BA1. Now, this is still surprising. So again, this latest data is showing that uh, BA2 is not, uh, not displacing BA1 very quickly at all in England. It has done somewhat in Northern Ireland. Why the difference there is not clear. Now BA2 is more common than BA1 in Northern Ireland. But why we're not following the Denmark pattern and BA2 is taking over rapidly is, is curious. It is curious and uh, there's no obvious reason for that. Uh, I, I can't think of an obvious reason and I haven't seen one postulated really either. The hospital admissions, well, this is, this is good news, that they are going down. I mean, there's this steady reduction in hospital admissions, which we're delighted to see. Uh, now, this is quite interesting. This is like a comparative graphic. So these are infections. So alpha became dominant, uh, beta became dominant. Uh, sorry, delta, alpha became dominant. Beta was only in South Africa. Delta became dominant. Let's go and say we get it right. There you go. Delta became dominant and uh, Omicron uh, became uh, dominant. And here we see percentage testing positive. So by far the highest number of people testing positive. OK, the testing was somewhat better, at least for the early stages. Testing has gone off now quite a lot. Uh, but but and actually, take that back. This is not based on testing. This is the Office for National Statistics data. So the, the number of cases officially in the UK has gone down dramatically, but the COVID symptom tracker data is still showing relatively high numbers. And these numbers here are from the Office for National Statistics survey. So the survey data is staying high while the official numbers of cases are going down because they're not being reported. So this is actually good uh, survey based data. So we can say that the uh, level of infection was higher during Omicron than in the previous waves. We don't have the data for back here really on that, but, but uh, it's looking likely. Uh, but then if we look at, if we go down and we look at say the hospitalizations when alpha became prevalent, very high, delta became prevalent, hospitalizations here lower because of the uh, higher vaccination status that was around and some developing natural immunity as well. Whereas Omicron, yes, there has been some increase in hospitalizations, but that's going down as we've seen quite nicely now, but has effect infected huge numbers of people based on the ONS survey data. So that is the closest thing to real numbers that we have really. So that's quite an interesting comparator. And deaths, likewise, deaths when uh, alpha became prominent, deaths went very high. Delta became prominent in this period here, but good vaccination status, so deaths were nothing like as high. Had it not been for vaccination, we could have seen this curve all over again in times of uh, delta, but we didn't. And this slight uptick in deaths that we've seen in terms of Omicron, purely because of the large numbers of people all, all, all infected at the same time. 
well, that was quite interesting. Deaths, well, you can see the waves there and they're going down. So encouraging that the deaths are currently going down in the UK. Now, people seem determined to misunderstand this, deaths with COVID and deaths from COVID. And I really don't see why, why the emotion is there. I say one little thing about it and people like jump at me for it. But, but um, let's, let's look at the definitive data just so, as we've done a hundred times on this channel. Um, so COVID-19 was the underlying cause of the majority of deaths where COVID-19 was mentioned anywhere on the death certificate. England and Wales, so we see that roughly 75% of cases, that's a 75% line there, at the moment are deaths from COVID. That means this other 25% are deaths with COVID. In other words, the infection was coincidental to the cause of the death. So we see three quarters of the deaths where COVID is mentioned on the death certificates are actually caused by COVID. In other words, these people would have gone on living for days, weeks, months, years, or potentially a decade or two longer. Although the average age of death is still around about 82. So we're probably talking months to several years longer. But nevertheless, um, we do see that this is clearly reflected in the data. So most of these deaths, three quarters of these deaths are deaths from COVID, 25% are deaths with COVID. Um, I don't think that's too hard to understand. And the, these are the main comorbidities. Uh, this is the percentage, so diabetes, um, chronic low respiratory disease, high blood pressure, urinary system, ischemic heart disease, uh, ill-defined conditions, dementia, heart failure, complications, cardiac arrhythmias, malignant neoplasms in the blood. COVID-19 with no pre-existing conditions, still around about the 17% mark. So hopefully that now is clarified. And I think that's the only, uh, that's the last slide I think we had on that. Now I'm just going to show you one more thing today. This is a letter. I don't know really what I can show you here, but this is, um, this is a letter from a British member of parliament to their constituent about the issue of uh, aspiration. Um, so the, my, the, the constituent uh, wrote to the MP, as I asked people to, the green book, which is our vaccination book, states it's not necessary to aspirate as part of the process of vaccination because there are no large blood blood vessels at the recommended injection sites. Now, I, I, I might as well show you these again, seeing we're here. Uh, this is the injection site, and as we see, here's some uh, large blood vessels. Um, can you see that? Yep, there's some large blood vessels there, around about the injection site. So, unless that anatomy is wrong, but there we see some more deep in the muscle. These are blood vessels, and they're uh, and they're co-combinant uh, veins. Com vena, vena, vena cominantes, the, the veins that go over the artery. So we clearly see in that area there we have these large blood vessels. And here we see the uh, anterior circumflex humeral artery and the veins that go with that, just not illustrated in this. Um, and here we see other large vessels. There's the artery going into the deltoid and there's the vein taking blood away from the deltoid. And those last three pictures are all from Gray's Anatomy. Uh, so the Green Book states it's not necessarily aspirated part of the process of vaccination because there are no large blood vessels. Well, I think we've just disproved that at the injection site. I am assured that the UK Health and Security Agency regularly reviews and updates the Green Book. Well, I'm pleased you're reassured by that. The World Health Organization. Uh, are people actually still referring to the World Health Organization as a definitive authority? Looks like they are <clears throat> also advises that aspiration should not be done during intramuscular injections. Well, I don't think the World Health Organization does actually say that, um, Miss, Miss, Miss or Mr or Ms MP. Um, I think that's referring specifically to vaccination. So, um, without being pedantic, and it's it's, it's not it's not a moot point because. If you take things like uh, depot phenothiazines for antipsychotics injections or, or, or depot um, contraceptives, which we still use, these are in oil. And if you don't aspirate those and they go into a blood vessel, 
uh, th then you can cause a, a pulmonary uh, whiteout. You'll get you'll get a um, pulmonary uh, fat embolism, uh, which of course goes without saying is remarkably serious. So I'm not sure the World Health Organization does say that. So maybe this MP hasn't got a clinical background. Uh, also advised that aspiration should not be done during intramuscular injections. I don't think that's true. Anyway, but the reason the reason the World Health Organization give. Um, for not aspirating during injections, this may increase pain due to longer contact time and lateral movement of the needle. Well, all I can say to that is not if I'm doing it. If you're doing it properly, the needle doesn't wobble around when you give it. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a, just a ridiculous thing to say. Technique can stabilise the needle. Uh, there's no data uh, to justify uh, th there is at present no data to justify aspiration, no evidence to suggest that this process could have an impact on the outcome of blood clots following vaccination. In that case, Miss or, Ms. or Mr. MP, why have Germany just changed the guidelines? Why have Denmark changed the guidelines under the, under the guidance of Professor Hoyby months and months ago? Moreover, th 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 this this bit. Listen, th this th th listen to this. This takes the biscuit. This really does take the biscuit, really. Um, moreover, should a vaccinator aspirate and draw blood? Well, how can they draw blood? Did you not just say there's no blood vessels in that area? So, so what you've just said is completely impossible. If there's no large blood vessels in the area, then it's completely impossible to draw blood. But now you're saying should they draw blood? You're contradicting yourself, Miss, Mr. Mr. Politician here, completely. Moreover, should a vaccinator aspirate blood? Obviously impossible, but should, they, should, should the impossible occur, they would be required to dispose of the needle and shot vaccine they were using, which would be an unjustified waste of vaccine, of precious vaccine supplies. In other words, this MP is saying it's better to give the vaccine intravenously than waste the shot. Let me say that again. This is implying to me that they are saying, this politician is saying, that it's better to give the vaccine into the wrong place, potentially causing unknown damage to the individual. It's better to do that, better to potentially ruin the life or even take the life potentially of an individual than to waste one dose of vaccine. So it takes the biscuit on two score, two scores. First of all, should you draw back blood, which is contradicting themselves because they say it's impossible, but of course we know it's not. And then they say you'd have to waste a dose of vaccine rather than give the drug in the wrong place. All nurses are taught to give the right dose of the right drug via the right route to the right patient at the right time. It's got to be via the right route. These vaccines must be intramuscular. But this letter is saying, oh, well, if you do happen to give it intravascularly into a blood vessel, then that's better than wasting it. Is that what they're saying? If I'm wrong, Mr. or Miss MP, come on and tell me, please. I'm um, seriously, because this sort of what I see is fobbing off is just completely uh, unacceptable. OK, that's... Um, that's a bit of a rant, but it's not really. It's based on it's based on Gray's Anatomy, for goodness sake, and 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 that that that, that illogical non sequelis uh, argument is just bizarre. Um, now, don't forget, a um, few of you have been asking. Books are still available completely free. Um, um, download them. Uh, my books: one on how the body works, one on how the no, one on how the body works, one on how the body goes wrong. <laughs> Get it right, John. Um, uh, this one, there's still hard copy available if you want that in hard copy. This one, I need to get around to reprinting it, but it's just a matter of um, getting around to it. But they're both available in um, for free, free, uh, free PDF download for all the you know you can. That one's about epilepsy there, for example. So um, yeah, download them. There's a mobile phone friendly version. <laughs> download them, put them on your phone. Next time you're bored, get out your mobile phone. And you won't be bored anymore, hopefully. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, that's us. Which camera am I? That's it. Thank you for watching.